Revelation chapter 3, verse 6 now. All right, repeat it over and over again. You all got ears? Yes, he that hath an ear, then what? Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Pay attention now what the Holy Spirit is telling you, guys. Better remember that. So notice verse 6, he is speaking to the churches here. That's why, hence, there has to be a double application. A spiritual application to the church and a doctrinal application to the tribulation. Uh, some people, they just don't keep tabs, I guess, in my Revelation videos. They just skip ahead. So if people are so confused about that, give me proof. Give me proof for double application. I already talked about it. So watch the video. It's called Double Prophecy. Double Prophecy, and it's part of our Revelation playlist. So please watch that, because I can't keep explaining myself here why it's double application. Okay, let's look at verse 7. Verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write. Okay, so God is speaking to John, write the letter to who? A representative of the church in Philadelphia. So again, remember, it's not speaking to the church itself. It's speaking to the representative of the church. So remember that. Okay, so it's speaking to the representative of the church. So meaning that the churches are hearing this. This, uh, this does apply to them. But remember, if he's speaking to a representative or an ambassador of the church, he's basically speaking to the whole thing that the person's representing. It's like an ambassador, right? An ambassador of the states would come over to a different nation, and the nation would talk about, hey, this is your nation's problem here. This is what you guys need to fix. And this representative, this ambassador, even though it's the, the, the other nation is speaking directly to this ambassador, it is, in a sense, speaking to the nation that the ambassador is representing, right? So that's the same idea here at Revelation 3.7, okay? So let's look at right here. So he is speaking to the representative of the, of the church in Philadelphia, but the, it is applying to the church in Philadelphia, right? These things saith he that is holy. So Jesus is holy, and he's going to say these particular things. He that is true, that is right. Jesus is faithful and true, amen? There's a song that goes, my redeemer is faithful and true. He that hath the key of David. Okay, this is where we're going to get some interesting deep doctrine. Okay, another one. Ready for this? So notice right here that Jesus Christ is supposedly, or actually not supposedly, he is. He is holding the key of David. Okay, so he is holding the key of David right here. Now, with this key of David, whatever this is, right? This key of David is supposed to do this. He that openeth, and no man shutteth. So this key of David, whatever this magic wand is, this magic key is, it's supposed to open, whatever doors it open, it opens, and no one can shut it. And shutteth, and no man openeth. So if you have this key, you can shut and lock the door, and no one can open that. Okay, what is this key of David right here? We're going to look at, so this is why double application is very important. That's why everything's going to make sense. If you put it only at one application, it's going to be confusing. Let's look at Isaiah. Isaiah. We're going to look at Isaiah 22. Isaiah 22. Now, notice that phrase. It says key of what? David, right? Since it says key of David, that sounds like a Jewish phrase, correct? Yeah, so it's going to be something Jewish right here. There's going to be no doubt about that. So let's see how it would apply to Israel in this case. We're going to look at the book of Isaiah chapter 22, verse 20. Now remember, Jesus is the one who's holding the key of David, right? Jesus, the Messiah. Now look how... The Old Testament talks about this Messiah figure here. This is interesting. Isaiah 22, verse 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, whoever he is, right? This person, though, is in verse 21. I will clothe him with thy robe, strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand. Huh. Sounds like a Messiah figure that the Jews have been waiting for. Remember, Isaiah, I don't know if you're familiar with this verse at Isaiah 9. What did they say about Jesus the Messiah? The government shall be upon his shoulder. 
So this could be referring to a Messiah figure, Jesus. But let's keep reading. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Which is true. Jesus Christ or the Messiah is a father figure of the Jewish people. Because God is. But look at verse 22. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. Now that answers the question at Revelation 3. Who has the key of David at Revelation 3? Jesus, right? Isaiah 22 talked about a Messiah figure, right? This means then Jesus is the Messiah. That's why Jews don't believe in that. But let's keep reading right here. So he shall open and none shall shut. Uh, let's keep reading right here. Uh, uh, and he shall shut and none shall open. So you're going to notice right here that Jesus Christ... He has the key of David where it shuts no man open and then a person tries to open but no man can shut. Now in Isaiah chapter 22, I can't say for certain if this is referring to Jesus Christ, but there's a lot right here concerning through the person of Eliakim that it is some sort of Messiah figure. There is no doubt about that. If I were to compare that with Revelation chapter 3, it really looks like Jesus Christ. But this one I can say for an undoubtable fact. An undoubtable fact is Jesus is the one who has the key of David. And I do know for a fact that the Jews, they cannot have access to this unless they go through Jesus Christ. Now here is something interesting then. So then what does this mean then that, a, a door, that this is supposed to be a door that a person can go in and go out? Well, a door means that you're supposed to have a house, right? So that's what it's referring to, a person entering inside this house. Well, what is this house? Why didn't you read verse 21, the last part? And to the what? House of Judah. And the key of the what? House of David. So now it's not just saying key of David, it's a house. So it's entering inside David's household. So here's the idea here. Doctrinally then, when we look at Revelation chapter 3, if you'll return back over there, return back to Revelation chapter 3. If we're going to go back here when God is speaking to the representative of the church of Philadelphia, he's saying this. He's saying that this particular location right here, that he's given them the key of the house of David that they can enter in. So, if this is a doctrinal application to the tribulation, these tribulation saints in the locality of a Philadelphia region right here, these are the people who are able to become a part of God's house. When, why? Because the house of David must rule in the millennium. Remember what God promised the house of David, the kingdom will be established, there shall be no end. That's referring to the millennium timeline. So then these tribulation saints, particularly in the Philadelphia region, they are given this uh, entrance because of their faithfulness, and that's why they're definitely going to be ruling with the nation of Israel at the millennium. So that's a doctrinal application to the house of David right here. Now remember that because... This is referring to a prophetic timeline and a doctrinal application to the tribulation. What must be understood is that when God is speaking about these seven regions, right? Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Remember, I mentioned that there were three applications here. That there were three applications. One, it was speaking to literal local churches at that time. But then it was carrying a prophetic application. So then we applied a doctrinal application, tribulation saints. So these are tribulation saints within these localities right here. And then the third application was spiritual. So Christians can learn from something right here. And then these localities would be referring to different church age timelines. See, so I explained those three to you. So I'm not going to explain it again. But I will give, I'll give one particular explanation, which is interesting. Prophes, uh, 
Prophecy is undoubtable. When you read the Bible, God would be speaking to a particular location. He'll be talking about Bethlehem or Jerusalem or Israel. But when he's speaking to that location, he would be speaking about the locality of that time, historical application. But because it's prophecy, it will carry on into the future as a doctrinal tribulation application. So you better do that with Revelation because Revelation is the book of prophecy. It already told you that at the first five verses. So you better start doing that. That's why this application makes sense, right? You have to do doctrinal, historical, spiritual. You have to do that. Okay, so let's keep reading right here. So then these Jews have this access. And then uh, I got a really interesting application for spiritual, but we will do that later, okay? So this is going to be interesting, though. Keep that in mind, though, is that this is tribulation Jewish for the keys of the house of David. But I'm going to show you a spiritual application for Christian, which is going to be really neat. 